Um, Dr. Isaacson works with us as our primary care physician um, for our street medicine team. And um, he earned his MD at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and completed his res residency training in family medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine at Montecito Medical Center. And prior to medical school, he worked in homeless street outreach and completed a master's in science in human nutrition at Columbia University. Dr. Isaacson joined Janian Medical Care in September 2018 and currently practices with the Brooklyn and Queens Street Medicine team and also serves as the primary care supervisor for Breaking Ground. And Dr. Isaacson and his colleagues are um, out in the field with our teams every week um, to see folks who are living on the street and to connect them to you know, urgent medical care assessment and uh, primary care. So we thank him for his work and for being here today. And I'll hand it over to you, uh, Lee. Uh, hey, everybody, good afternoon. Um, okay, so I've got some slides prepared um, that I'll run through relatively quickly and then to leave sort of the maximum amount of time for questions. And then um, if we need to like loop back on something, um, that is, uh, we can do that. Um, and okay, so let's just sort of get into it. Um, okay, so what is the 2019 novel coronavirus? So this is a brand new virus um, in the coronavirus family. Um, that's what the novel part means. Um, it's pretty similar um, to the SARS uh, virus, uh, which caused an, uh, an outbreak back in 2009, and the MERS virus, which caused um, an outbreak back in 2012. Um, it's kind of confusing because there are uh, it's kind of a big family of viruses uh, that have different strains, and so um, you can think of like a strain as just a branch of that family, and so one strain contains SARS and MERS and now uh, 2019 novel coronavirus, um, and then one of the other strains, which is like a different branch of that family, um, contains four viruses that cause the common cold um, that we sort of all do, are used to dealing with. Um, okay, so what's the difference between coronavirus and COVID-19? So the virus's official name is SARS-CoV-2, um, but it's often referred to as novel coronavirus, or 2019 coronavirus, or just coronavirus. Um, and then the disease caused by the virus is called COVID-19. And so the way you can think of that is like the difference between HIV and AIDS. HIV is the name of the virus, and AIDS is the name of the disease that the virus causes. So where and when did it start? Um, it originated in Wuhan, which is a city in Hubei province in China. Um, it was first reported by the WHO on December 31st, and it's since spread all over the world. Um, the first confirmed case in the United States was in January 20th in Washington state. Um, so a lot of times people have been comparing COVID-19 um, to the flu, um, which makes sense um, because they're both um, sort of viral diseases that have a really similar uh, symptom profile, so they can both cause fever, both cause cough and shortness of breath, they cause sore throats, muscle aches, fatigue, um, and then both can cause uh, pneumonia, so a lower lung infection, um, and they can both kill people. Uh, both diseases can also be mild, and they can be uh, for some and severe for others, um, and sometimes even requiring the ICU. Um, so how long uh, is someone sick with COVID-19? So people with mild to moderate symptoms uh, usually have like a seven to 10 day course um, where, they're, where they're feeling pretty bad for a couple of the days, uh, much like when people get the flu. Um, if you've ever talked to anyone who's had the flu or had it yourself, you know, it can sort of not feel on your butt for, you know, a couple of days or in a week. And it's not like, it's not like having a cold. It's something that, you know, you're sick and you notice it. And so when we talk about mild to moderate COVID-19, we mean people are sick and they feel bad, but they're not so sick that they require hospitalization. People with more severe disease or even critical disease require hospitalization and sometimes even ICU level of care um, with um, respirators and or sorry, with ventilators. Um, and people who are, who are that sick can sometimes be sick for a month or more. Um, okay, so how is it spread? This is um, an important point. So it's spread by respiratory droplets. Um, this is you know, the best way to think of this is like that kind of like cloud or mist that gets made when somebody sneezes. Um, and so those droplets can hang out in the air for um, up to a couple of hours. And then depending on how big they are, they slowly fall to the ground 
um, and then uh, remain on those surfaces. Um, and I believe there's another slide that talks about that, but if not, I'll, I'll talk about it uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, so it's not, this is a, an important point that I want to make, it's not spread by airborne. So something that's spread by airborne is something like measles and something that's airborne spread is just, it's just spread by people breathing. So like if someone, you know, measles is, is really contagious and is a good example of, of an airborne virus. So if somebody has measles and they just walk through a room breathing normally, somebody else can walk through that room a couple of hours later and also just be breathing and, and contract measles if they're not already immune. That is not how this virus is spread. It's spread through respiratory droplets, um, which means somebody sneezes, um, they sneeze into their hand, they don't wash their hands, they touch uh, a doorknob or something like that, where it can live for a couple of hours to days. You then touch that doorknob, and you don't wash your hands, and then you pick your nose or touch your eye or stick your finger in your mouth because you're eating or something like that, and then you can get the disease. Um, so that's sort of how it spread, or just by like it, um, that mist of, of droplets is kind of hanging out in the air invisibly, um, you could sort of breathe that in and that would be another way you could get it. Um, okay, so the virus is not, uh, it, it is found in feces and it's currently unknown if it's spread by fecal oral route that's under active investigation. Um, and it's not spread through urine, semen, vaginal fluids, um, doesn't seem to be spread through breast milk, um, and it's unknown at this time, although it seems not that likely for it to be spread vertically uh, from a pregnant woman to her, the fetus she's carrying. Um, okay. All right, so it's also spread by surface touching. Um, can live, so the droplets fall out just like I said, it can live for a couple of hours um, uh, in the air and up to three days if unbothered. Okay, so how contagious is it? So this is pretty contagious. Um, so the current estimates are for every one person that's sick with COVID-19, they will infect between two and three un pre like previously uninfected people. Um, so that makes it much more contagious than the flu. Uh, the flu, the sort of seasonal flu uh, makes, for every one sick person, they will infect uh, just over one uninfected person. And that's why we're seeing particularly in places like New York, um, we're seeing really, really high um, increases in the number of cases each day because it's really easy to spread this around because it's growing, you know, sort of, it's an exponent, it's a, you know, one, one person infecting two to three people will produce an exponential growth curve. And it's left to its own devices. Um, okay, so the case fatality rate. So this is still being calculated. And, and I'll say that, you know, we are, all of this is kind of still under active investigation and. And what's making this, you know, confusing, kind of stressful is that the recommendations are changing frequently and we're learning new stuff all the time and we have to revise things from time to time. And, um, but the case fatality rate is sort of an ongoing calculation. Um, and it changes really, really dramatically based on age and whether or not a person has a pre-existing medical condition. So the most recent data I saw from yesterday, the case fatality rate in New York City is between 0.0%, 0.07% and 8.2%, depending on age group. Um, the 8.2 percent is in people above the age of 75, kind of regardless of. Um, well, let me back up and say, okay. So so far in New York City, 95 percent of the people that have died from COVID-19 have had some sort of underlying medical condition. Um, so given that, um, the 8.2 percent uh, fatal case fatality rate is for people above the age of 75, and the 0.07. Uh, percent fatality rate uh, is for people between ages in, uh, 0 and 44. Okay, so who is the most at risk? So based on what I just said, so everybody, everybody age 70 or up, even if you have no medical conditions, if you're above the age of 70, you're at risk for getting a serious uh, complication or serious course of the disease. Um, everyone who's aged 50 and older with a pre-existing medical condition, and these include diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, asthma, or different kinds of chronic lung disease like COPD, People who are immunosuppressed, which are people who have cancer, or HIV, or autoimmune conditions on medications. Okay, so how can we stop the spread? People are talking about this all the time. How do we flatten the curve um, and, and save the healthcare system from being super overwhelmed? So staying home as much as possible um, is the best way to stop the spread. Um, that way, if you do get sick, you're already kind of home and isolated and you haven't infected other people. 
social distancing when being outside, which is staying six feet or more away from everybody and away from that sort of invisible germ cloud that you can think of everyone having around them. Washing your hands very often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, which has at least 60% alcohol. And cleaning frequently touched surfaces often. Um, and that'll kind of like break the chain of in infectiousness. And obviously, and then within all that, trying to limit how much you're touching your face, which is where your nose and your mouth and your eyes are, which are places, which are sort of routes for the, the infection to get in. Is there a treatment or vaccine? There are currently no approved treatments at this time. Um, people with mild to moderate disease, who by the way, make up 80%, so worldwide data tells us that 80% of the people who get this disease will do fine and not require hospitalization. Of the remaining 20%, 15 will require just regular, a regular hospital, 15% will require a regular hospital bed, and 5% will require ICU level care. So those that have mild to moderate disease, they just need to stay at home, they need to rest, they need to treat their symptoms. For example, if they're having a fever and they're feeling uncomfortable, they could take Tylenol. There are some current, uh, currently experimental treatments that are being investigated for those with um, severe disease. Um, a trial of, of some of the medications started here in New York State um, on Tuesday, um, which are um, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And if you have questions about that, I can answer them. Um, and while there's currently no vaccine, um, people are developing, racing to develop a vaccine kind of all around the world. Um, and there's an ongoing vaccine trial um, here in this country that started a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we won't know the results of that probably realistically for another like 18 months. Um, oh, and one thing about the vaccines before we get into the into questions. So people, um, people are familiar with the flu shot, the flu vaccine, which you know works between 40 and 60 percent each year, depending on um, depending on the year. And part of the reason why it's so hard to develop a flu shot is because um, every summer the flu virus retreats into pigs and uh, its whole genome reshuffles around it. That's these like really, really big genetic changes. The coronavirus um, family has a much, much more stable genome and so is a much more likely candidate for a successful vaccine uh, to be developed. Okay, so please keep washing your hands uh, and I'm ready for questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Isaacson. Um, the first question that, that was sent is, will these slides be emailed to participants? Yes, they will. And um, we are also recording this session and we uh, can share this recording as well. Um, the, the next question for Dr. Isaacson is, besides Tylenol and quarantine, what other medications can people take? Is Advil safe to take? So there was some reports, um, particularly from the French Minister of Health, that taking uh, medicines like Advil, so that family is called uh, NSAIDs, um, people who have taken those will have a, a worse um, COVID-19 course um, if they take them. The theory is that uh, those medic medicines are anti-inflammatory and, and the inflammatory response is part of your immune response. And so knocking those down, that response down even a little bit uh, would cause someone to have a worse COVID-19 course. Um, it hasn't been backed up with clinical data. That said, um, I think uh, if, you're, if you're looking to, to try and treat your fever, if you have this, um, Tylenol, there's, you know, Tylenol is um, just as good, if not a better fever reducer uh, than something like Advil. But what we know from, from the, from, I haven't seen any data that, that, um, that backing, that's backing up that, that French minister's claim. I think it is sort of, it's this theoretical possibility. But just to be safe, I'm recommending, I do recommend that people take Tylenol, not, not Advil, if you can, if you have it. Okay, there was another kind of follow-up question about what people can take. Is there anything else, um, any other kind of medications that people should be taking, or is Tylenol pretty much the recommended course? Yeah, Tylenol is the is the recommended. I mean, I think you've, if you have a sore throat, um, you could take like you know, warm uh, you know warm tea with honey or lemon and things like that. Um, but I don't. I generally don't recommend cough suppressants or cough syrup. Um, 
And then one of the things that's been in the, in the news a lot is people who are taking that medicine I mentioned, uh, hydroxychloroquine, as a prophylaxis, so as a preventive medicine, um, is really not recommended. Um, aside from the fact that the medicine itself carries certain side effects and potential toxicities and drug-drug interactions, um, people taking that medicine and getting it prescribed to them by their doctors unnecessarily um, are taking it away from people with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis who really, really need that medicine to not be sick themselves. Um, you know, drug makers are, are working on ramping up the, the production of that medicine, but um, until that time is happening, we, we really do not actually save it for the people who need it. Um, and there's no evidence right now that, that taking it prophylactically is a good idea. In fact, it, it's most likely more harmful uh, as an as a asymptomatic healthy person uh, to take that medicine. Thank you. Okay, so we have um, a lot of housing providers and other homeless service providers, and I'm wondering if maybe you could speak a little bit to um, how this directly impacts people experiencing homelessness, as well as um, those maybe in like supportive housing who have formerly been homeless and have compromised health. Yeah, so um, I think in general, the, the homeless community, both unsheltered and sheltered, and then in supportive housing, um, tend to be, uh, would, would all, almost all be considered vulnerable for, for COVID-19. Um, in general, they're older. Um, they, many of them have coexisting comorbidities uh, that I mentioned. And then people who are staying in shelters or any sort of congregate housing, um, those are places where we wanna be, where, where a, a contagious virus could spread really easily. Um, and so we want to be really, really careful um, about identifying people with symptoms um, as quickly as possible and then moving them into isolation. And so now I think it, it makes sense to talk about um, who's, who can spread the disease and kind of when and what, what the difference between quarantine and isolation is. So, um, and if people are not understanding this, I can make a slide about it. But um, so I think it's helpful to think of of four people, sort of four categories of people when we think about the infectiousness of this, of this disease. So there's somebody who, uh, or maybe I missed five, so somebody who's healthy and doesn't have the disease, um, somebody who is uh, infected with the disease but doesn't yet have symptoms, so they're asymptomatic but infected, um, somebody who is infected and having symptoms, and somebody who um, has recovered and is now healthy again. And so the people that can spread this disease are the people who are infected but not yet having symptoms, so the asymptomatic infected person and the symptomatic infected person. Um, and we think that, you know, and so one of the reasons why it's important to stay home is if you're one of the asymptomatic infected people, you can spread this disease um, without even knowing it because you don't have symptoms yet. And so that's why the recommendation from the Department of Health is if you're feeling well, stay home. Um, and if you're feeling sick but not so sick, you need to go to the hospital, also stay home. Um, and then, oh, and then the other thing about, back to like um, sort of homeless individuals in general and, and in shelter settings, um, I think one of the things that also makes it challenging to think about uh, managing an outbreak uh, in these settings and, and, with, our, and with our clients um, is the fact that they, that our clients don't always listen to the rules kind of at baseline um, and don't necessarily, um, easily kind of adhere to the protocols. And so thinking about ways in which we're gonna like add even more protocols that are like really, really sort of at, you know, at face value kind of draconian and, and, and really sort of strange, um, you know, makes sort of that kind of that idea even more challenging. And oh, and if you're a shelter provider uh, and you've got um, questions, the, the CDC released two guidelines um, two days ago or three days ago, um, one about um, guidance about COVID-19 in unsheltered homeless individuals and then um, guidance for shelter providers. And if you go to the HUD exchange, um, those resources are there as well as um, a webinar from yesterday um, from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, 
Uh, it's like an interview from the King County people in Seattle talking about their preparedness um, measures and, and kind of the, some of the stuff that they've done um, for isolating and, and kind of de, um, depopulating their shelter system a little bit in preparation and in response to this. Okay, we have a question from uh, somebody who works in an emergency department. Uh, we are seeing a lot of homeless patients, even those with very mild symptoms coming into the EDs. What other options are there for street outreach teams aside from sending patients who appear well to ERs? Um, I guess somebody who appears well, but they're worried about COVID-19 in the, in the individual. So the Department of Homeless Services has set up um, some isolation shelters. Um, I know there's one in Brooklyn, and I know there's one in the Bronx, and I, I don't know about Manhattan and Queens, but I imagine they filter into those locations. And so outreach teams, if you have, um, they have medical providers that they work with, they can reach out to them. Um, but uh, the Department of Homeless Services has agreed to isolate people in the isolation shelters who fit any of the following criteria. So have been tested and test positive, but are not so sick that they need to be in the hospital. Um, people who are test positive or sick enough to be in the hospital, but are now ready for discharge. Um, and then people who have symptoms of like and presumed positive COVID-19, but have not gone to the hospital and not gotten tested. DHS has agreed to, to isolate all of those people and the way that you access those services um, is by calling uh, the serious incident unit. Um, and if, they're, if you're an outreach um, worker um, or someone who's like really on the front line, front line, um, I imagine you're in, I would check with your individual agency to make sure to see what your, your individual protocols are, but I'd imagine you, it sort of involves calling like a supervisor and, and, and we, you know, everyone wants to be keeping track of all that stuff also. But um, DHS does not want to send um, people who are infected um, or presumed to be infected back to the shelter setting because that's a, a recipe for, for spreading the virus. Um, okay, another question. Are there any special precautions we should be taking for tenants in a congregate care setting that have diabetes and other various health concerns such as epilepsy besides the usual guidelines of hand washing, sanitizer, et cetera? I mean, those are kind of, and I think we can also encourage people to, to be socially distant from one another. I mean, I think if people are in the same household, if they're sharing a suite or something like that, that's, that's a lot more challenging. And, um, and it sort of breaks down to if, if, there's, if they're sharing a bathroom, anyone who's sharing a bathroom with one another can sort of be considered exposed to each other's germs. Um, and those people should still be practicing good hand, hand washing etiquette and, and cough etiquette and and like cleaning the services and things like that. But among like different suites um, or different households or, or people from different rooms trying to exercise uh, social distancing within the programs as much as possible, um, considering staggering meal times so there's less people in congregated meal areas and separating people out um, farther uh, within those um, cafeteria settings, um, trying to space people out in common areas and things like that. I'm gonna combine a few questions that is particularly about uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. Um, it still seems to be in very, um, very difficult to obtain um, for different providers and um, wondering if, if you know of any other resources for how to obtain this uh, protective equipment and supplies. Um, I don't know any resources. I saw a Google doc yesterday of just like people around New York City kind of uploading when they've got like caches of masks and gloves and stuff and sort of offering to either drop it off or have people come pick it up. Um, I know a lot of the, the suppliers are not, um, I know they're not selling PPE to anyone that they've never sold PPE to before, um, which is a problem that some of the programs are having. My hope is that as the the state and federal stockpiles are now being opened up to New York City that the DHS might have um, increased access. I know when we asked them yesterday or the day before for more PPE, um, 
they they told us they had none and that they weren't expecting to get any more. Um, I don't have any great solutions. My two cents on PPE is that, so two things. Number one, so New York City um, is now considered a, a place that has widespread community transmission. And what that means in practicality is, is that you can sort of assume that everybody out and about in their daily life uh, has ex been, ex including yourselves, have been exposed to the disease, you know, and been exposed to the virus. Um, and so at any moment, anyone could develop symptoms, and at that point, they should, they should isolate themselves. And so PPE, um, certainly like things like masks, are, is really designed to like keep the, the wearer of the masks, germs from spreading to other people. Which is why we we ask we're asking people who are encountering like a, a sick or coughing client that the first thing you should do is to is to put a mask on that client and that in that way um, you're you're achieving what we call source control um, and so you're um, you're now sort of keeping that person's germs in, into themselves. Um, but I, yeah, I I do wish that there was more PPE around for people, especially on the front lines, to be able to uh, to be wearing. And is there, um, are there masks of any other material other than the N95 that are useful? Yeah, so just the, the general surgical mask is actually useful. So, and that is actually what's recommended to healthcare providers in just kind of their everyday um, interactions with patients. It's, it's what I've been wearing um, when I'm interacting with just with people. Now, if you're interacting with someone who has known COVID-19, it's a little different, but it's sort of in your day-to-day -day interactions with, with clients and, or, you know, patients, it's, it's fine. And, and one of the things that I've been talking to people about is the fact that, you know, th we are almost 100% sure that this spreads by respiratory droplets. And there's no reason to think that our existing precautions against respiratory droplets are somehow gonna be inadequate or not effective against this virus that spread by respiratory droplet, even though it's effective and adequate against all the other viruses that spread by respiratory droplet. Now, the caveat that is, and so what an N95 mask is, uh, a medical grade N95 mask is, is they come in different sh a couple different shapes and they're fitted to, your, to a, a wearer's face using a special test to determine if, uh, that it's got a good seal. And if it has a good seal, it will seal out 95% of all particles. Um, including airborne particles. And so an N95 mask is really for airborne spread. And so we're trying to save them for the people in the hospital who are doing procedures that, that generate aerosols. And, when, and this is where like the airborne thing is a little confusing. You can think of an aerosol as like a really, really tiny droplet, but still like a really, like a really, really tiny like drop of, of, of um, sort of like saliva or something like that, that is so small that it easily hangs out in the air and even travels through the air a little bit. And so we want to save the N95 masks which will protect against those aerosols to the people who are doing things that generate aerosols. So people who are um, intubating people, so putting tubes down their, thro uh, their throats into their lungs to, to hook them up to a ventilator, um, people who are doing things like that, people that, that are really, really up close to really sick people. Um, but the, ev the everyday interaction between, even between a, a a doctor and the patient usually just needs a regular surgical mask. In this case, a regular surgical mask plus eye protection plus gloves and a gown. Okay. Um, this has to do with uh, when you should go to the hospital. At what point, besides should you go to the hospital, the protocol for hospital has been fever of 100.4. But I read that having digestive issues is a precursor to respiratory issues. Is that true? And how many days should one wait before they go to the ER? Um, yeah, so the, the symptoms that we're thinking of is sort of like being the, the classic starts of this hour are like fever, cough, shortness of breath, and sore throat. Um, that said, other, you know, there have been plenty of reports of people having diarrhea, people having vomiting, people having muscle aches people kind of having headaches and feeling generally out of it, people feeling fatigued or, um, and then there've been a lot of reports of people losing the sense of smell or losing the sense of taste. Um, so 
even if you've got all of the things that I just mentioned, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should go to the hospital. So you should go to the hospital. So the, the recommendation from the Department of Health right now is, okay, you start not feeling well, you stay home, and you monitor your symptoms for three or four days. If on the third or fourth day you're still feeling bad, then at that point you contact your medical provider to talk to them about what they think the next best steps are. Um, now, at any point at the, at the very, very beginning or in the middle, you're having like serious trouble breathing. Like you're taking a deep breath and you like really, really feel like you're not getting enough air. Um, you're feeling like confused and out of it. Um, or you're with someone and you notice that they're feeling confused and out of it, or that their like lips are turning blue and gray. Like that's someone who, or you know, or somebody who's having like really, really bad chest pain. Um, but that's someone who might need emergency care, um, and they, and they shouldn't hesitate to go to the hospital. Yeah. So the, the, what we want when we, people talk about like flattening the curve and, and protecting the healthcare system, it's to protect it's to protect the healthcare system from. Um, by being overrun by people who sort of just feel a little bit bad in order to keep the hospital for the people who are really sick and really need that care. Um, and so like I said, right, 80% of people are going to get this. It's going to have a really, really mild course. It's, they're going to feel bad, but not so bad that they need to go to the hospital. And those are the people that we want to stay home and rest and recuperate at home. To really save the hospital for that 20% that, that need it. Okay, a question about can it, the virus be transmitted through food and on clothing? Would you recommend sanitizing or laundering clothes after a high-risk encounter? For example, speaking with someone po who's positive for COVID-19 or visiting a high-risk location such as an ER or riding the subway? Um, okay, so what was the, sorry, what was the first part of the question? First part was can it be transmitted through food and on clothing? Okay, so it can be transmitted through food, but it can be transmitted through shared utensils. Um, so, don't, so sharing forks and spoons and cups um, could be a way that it could be transmitted. Um, and then about the laundry thing. So um, the initial data seems to show that it can live, uh, the virus will live sort of and then die on its own if no one touches it. Um, after 24 hours or less on cardboard. And so I sort of think of cardboard as like really, um, it's like a poor, cardboard is like a, a, a poor approximation of, of, of clothing, but better than say like a piece of steel. Um, but it seems like the, the, the more absorbent the material is, um, the harder it is for, the, for it to be a vehicle for virus transmission. Um, that said, I think it does make sense to uh, alter your laundry protocols a little bit, uh, given the outbreak. Um, so I will tell you what I do, um, which is that I sort of now consider the clothes that I wear outside of the house to kind of be like one time use only before laundry. Um, so I don't, you know, keep wearing the same, you know, I won't just put a pair of pants that I wore once back in the closet. I sort of make a pile um, and say these pants were worn once and, and now it's time for, for laundry. Um, and you don't need to do anything special to the laundry. And, and this in, includes, let's say, um, someone in your household becomes positive and um, you're now looking after them while they're in isolation. You don't have to do anything special to the laundry. Um, you should try not to like hug a pile of laundry to yourself when you're carrying it, if there's infected, potentially sort of like clothing from an infected person in there. It's a good idea to wear gloves, um, but then just wash it on, on the normal sort of warm or hot settings and, and dry it in a hot dryer um, using regular soap. Um, and then one more thing about like the routines and, and the high risk areas. So I think it makes sense given how widespread the virus is out in the community to develop uh, like I've gotten home from the outside world routine. So having like a dedicated bowl by your front door for like your wallet and your keys and your headphones. And that is like, that bowl is full of dirty stuff um, and it just kind of stays dirty. And so you put your stuff in that dirty bowl and then you immediately go and you wash your hands um, and wipe down your phone. I'd say like, you know, that is sort of like bare minimum, like I've gotten home and now I'm like, sort of, if you think of your home as like a, a clean zone, 
um, you're now like getting back into the clean zone. And then within your home, it makes sense to be sanitizing high touch areas at least once a day. And so high touch areas are light switches, doorknobs, the back of chairs that you touch all the, uh, that you move all the time, um, faucets, uh, toilet plungers, or not toilet, yeah, the, whatever, the thing you push to make the toilet flush, um, keyboards, mice, telephones, things like that, TV remotes. We have a few questions about um, how the virus can be transmitted to people under 18 and even younger children. Um, and, and then also um, how to support clients um, who have symptoms or who have tested positive, but who still need to care for um, children in the house. Um, yeah, so the, well, that's, this has been one of the really interesting things about this virus is we, we know it infects people under the age of 18, but it doesn't really seem to make the vast, vast, vast majority of them sick. Um, so we think there's a good chance that, that, that asymptomatic kids and, and young adults um, who have been infected are, are one of the things that have been driving the outbreak because they're spreading the virus, but they don't, they're not sick, they don't notice it. Um, and we don't really know why they're not getting sick, but as far as I'm concerned, it's a good thing they're not getting sick and we'll figure out the why later. Um, so I think just trying to encourage kids to um, wash their hands a lot um, and, um, and maybe not share uh, forks and, and knives and things like that um, is a good thing. Um, and then, and then asking, your, you know, asking the kids to also practice social distancing principles. And so um, unfortunately, that means no more playing with uh, kids outside of the household um, and things like that. What general advice would you give to folks with ongoing respiratory illness, specifically asthma, in general care, um, including social distancing and staying home and monitoring symptoms for their illness versus potential coronavirus? Um, that's a great question. So, yeah, like, so, you know, it's March 25th, the trees are beginning to bloom, we're entering pollen season, people's allergies are about to start kicking up, and that will trigger people's asthma. And it's going to become a little bit confusing and scary for some about trying to figure out if this is just like your usual asthma or allergies or if this is COVID-19. And so I would say if you've had asthma for many, many years and you know without fail every April, you know, first week of April um, when, when some pollen gets activated, your asthma um, kicks in and you start needing uh, to use your inhaler more and you're having like an asthma induced cough. And sure enough, like in a week's time when it's early April and that starts happening again and it feels just like it has for the last 10 years, you, I think you can be confident that that is exactly what it is. And so what we're, when we think about uh, COVID-19, it's somebody who has a new cough that we can't explain by another reason. I think is then when we're suspicious. And so if this feels like something that you've had before, um, like your asthma, like an asthma cough or something like that, um, and you can explain it with a good reason, then there's a chance that, then there's a good chance that that's what's going on. Um, and so I would, I would um, touch base with your, as we go into like pollen season and, and asthma and your know, change of season, and it's gonna flare people's asthma, talking to your, to your healthcare provider, and I know, many of uh, places are doing uh, visits by phone now or, or through like the online patient portal like my chart or something like that making sure that you have your inhalers um, that you've got antihistamines uh, allergy medicine for allergy season things like that So um, we have some questions about alternative sites, I think like isolation sites for people who um, either are homeless but are not within the DHS shelter system, um, as well as uh, people who live in more congregate um, settings and are there, um, are there places available for those folks to go who um, are not necessarily symptomatic but are at increased risk or vulnerability? 
I don't think there's isolation available um, for people who are just at increased vulnerability. Um, and I would, I, my understanding of the way the DHS isolation is working is that it, it is open to people who are like from, say like a breaking ground safe haven. Um, it's not just people who are in DHS only shelters. Um, and, and then things may change as this outbreak continues. And I think one of the things that to keep an eye out is, is as people move from needing isolation to just kind of needing recovery, uh, I wouldn't be surprised or I, I hope that they do open facilities that sort of do congregate recovery. And we may see that that's what some of these like FEMA field hospitals are used for, um, of sort of like almost like lumping together everyone who has mild uh, well, no, everyone has like moderate disease that requires hospitalization um, where they like are too, they're too sick to be with their families, but they're not so sick they need to be in the hospital and maybe not, they don't even need oxygen. And so maybe it's a good idea to like put a bunch of them um, in like a, a field hospital or something like that. Um, and I would hope that DHS would sort of offer something, um, but I'm not sure. Um, and on that point, there was a question about whether somebody who has had COVID-19 and recovered is able to contract it again. That is, um, that is sort of an ongoing question. Uh, there have been some case reports of people out of China who have gotten uh, COVID, uh, gotten coronavirus and gotten sick with COVID-19 and then recovered and then caught the virus again. Um, so one of the things that's coming um, online, hopefully very soon, is something called serology or antibody testing. And so this is a blood test that'll let us see who is who, who out of those who have recovered is in fact immune to to the virus. And that might be a part of the the governor's sort of like letting people go back to work strategy. You might only be able to go back to work if you've got a swab that says that you're immune. Um, it might also help us see, um, like later on down the road, as we're trying to like figure out the exact uh, extent of the of the of the outbreak, of sort of saying, um, let's just see if you know everyone's antibody status, and and maybe somebody will, somebody will come up and say, you know, I I didn't have coronavirus, I never got COVID, you know, I never was sick with COVID nineteen, and then you test their blood, and when it turns out that they're immune, um, and so that person maybe was like a, an asymptomatic sort of spreader um during the outbreak and so i those tests are um are like just about ready i think for for more widespread um use uh the fda has uh issued like an emergency approval and um, it basically says if you're a trusted company that's made something like this before and you say the test is good like we'll we'll let you go ahead and start making it um, so i would keep an eye out um, for that stuff Is there a list of medical providers associated with DHS isolation shelters that we can access for clients who exhibit more severe symptoms for testing positive uh, to facilitate a shelter transfer process? Not to my knowledge. Um, I would call um, I would call you the SIU or the I don't know if the H and H COVID nineteen hotline is still working, which was that nine two nine number, um, but that might also be a good resource. Three one one is is also not a terrible resource, but I since uh, if you're DHS affiliated, I would start with the SIU. And uh, I've heard a range of reports from people being helpful and it being a pleasant process to it not being not so helpful. Are children with asthma at increased risk? Um, it doesn't seem to be the case, no. Um, okay, there have been a few theoretical reports regarding the consumption of red meat under the circumstances. In short, it was said that COVID-19 can in fact thrive on the surface of unprepared meat. How plausible is this theory? Huh, I have not heard that yet. Um, uh, I guess it's possible. Yeah, I mean, if 
I would, yeah, I, I mean, I think the same advisories about consuming raw or uncooked meat supply. I don't know if you're, I don't know how likely it is to get, like if somebody sneezes on like a, in a hamburger bowl and you eat that raw hamburger, I don't know how likely it is or not likely for you to get coronavirus. Are there any additional precautions we can recommend to clients who must frequently, uh, who must frequent highly trafficked locations due to their health conditions? Um, for example, MMTP programs, dialysis clinics. Um, I would talk to those clients, and I think it's worth talking to all clients, kind of just about what their general like hygiene practices are. Like, what do they do to wash their hands? What do they do for the bathroom? Um, if they stay outside, are there like cafes nearby that they use, or do they just kind of leave themselves wherever? Do they need hand sanitizer? Things like that. Um, all of the like dialysis centers and, and other places um, should have received really quite specific guidance from um, from the, the departments of health um, about uh, what to do to prevent spreads and outbreaks. Could you just review the current testing guide, uh, guidelines from the City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene um, and, uh, you know, which type of staff um, require PPE? So the current guidelines from the City Department of Health are that the only people who need testing are those admitted to the hospital. And that if you're, if you're well enough to be outside the hospital, you don't need to be tested. But the City Department of says, Health says, if you're well, stay home, and if you're sick, stay home. Um, and I'll tell you some of the rationale behind that. And, and, and you know, this, this is a, a change from what the, the recommendations were at the very beginning of the outbreak, and, and this might change again. Um, but right now, because, um, right now, basically, if you're sick and you've got mild symptoms, and you're like previously healthy, and, and, you know, the influenza virus is still out there, it's still at the, kind of the very end of, of flu season, but it's a lot less pre uh, present than it was a couple of weeks ago. And so it's like, if you're a generally healthy person, um, including somebody with, you know, uh, who's middle-aged and with well-controlled um, comorbidities, um, and you suddenly develop a new fever and a new cough, a new shortness of breath, um, and there's a very contagious virus that's going around that causes those same things, we can go ahead and say, you're presumed positive. There's no reason to think that you've got something else. You should stay home and self-isolate for three or four days if you still feel bad, then contact your provider. Um, we don't gain anything by, by, by knowing for sure if that person is positive or not, because like I said, there's no medicine specifically targeted against this virus, and so it's not, so knowing that somebody is positive is not gonna change their clinical management. But if someone's sick enough to be in the hospital, we wanna know definitively if they're positive or not, because there's a lot of other reasons why people might have a cough or be short of breath, um, and require hospitalization. And so we don't want to miss a bacterial pneumonia that can be treated with antibiotics or someone who's in heart failure or something like that um, by, by making the assumption that they have COVID-19. And so those people should be tested um, so that we can sort of differentiate those things. Um, so that's the current recommendation. The current recommendation is if you don't feel so sick that you need to go to the hospital, stay home, and if you're still feeling like just as crappy on day four as you did on day one, contact your medical provider. If you're beginning to feel better, you can sort of go with that. Um, and then the recommendations for PPE, I think probably vary agency to agency. Um, I'd say the best thing that you can do um, to protect yourself is to try and stay six feet away from, um, from both fellow staff members and clients as much as possible. Wash your hands a lot. I encourage everybody around you to wash their hands a lot. Um, try not to touch your face, clean surfaces. Um, I, I get that people want to be wearing masks, um, and I want to support people feeling safe and secure in their workplaces. Um, I will just say that a lot of times when you end up wearing a mask, it ends up being even in, so, like, so let's say you're just like, in, everyday person who's not used to wearing a mask and all of a sudden you're starting to wear a mask and gloves at work. 
Um, I'm, not, I'm someone who doesn't normally wear a mask at work, and I've been wearing a mask um, when I see patients. Um, and I can tell you, it's really, I touch my face so much more when I, because I'm wearing this mask than I did if I wasn't. And so I'm, I try to be really conscious of it and, and know that if I want to adjust my mask, that I clean my hands before I touch my mask and then again afterwards. Um, and that I know that if, just because I'm wearing gloves, that you know, the gloves can get dirty and then I could touch my face with those dirty gloves or touch the mask with the dirty gloves and then I take the gloves off and then I touch the mask with my clean hand and you know, I forget to wash it. And so it sort of quickly becomes a situation where, where wearing the mask and gloves has actually become a little bit more dangerous than not wearing the mask and being really, really thorough about washing hands and washing surfaces and staying six feet away and, and covering people's cough and things like that. That is very helpful to know. I know it's probably a lot of psychological feeling like we are protected with those masks, but very important point as somebody who's also worn a mask and it is hard not to fiddle with them because yeah. they're very uncomfortable. And, <laughs> yeah, and you, and you know, like, and, and you know, I wear, I'm wearing a mask because I've been so exposed to the virus that, that I'm wearing a mask to protect everyone around me so that the second I develop symptoms, I'm already, I already have source control. And so it's really to protect everybody around me from me because I have such a high exposure rate um, than it is to protect me from everybody else. Okay, um, this is a, a really important question, I think, for probably a lot of the people that we serve. Um, if someone does not have a medical provider um, due to lack of insurance or any other reason, um, who can you contact for next steps? Um, should you go to City Med or Urgent Care or is there a hotline? You could. Um, I'd say that the, the city hospital infrastructure, so um, those are the, the 11 public hospitals, um, Bellevue, Elmhurst, uh, Harlem Hospital, uh, North Central Bronx, um, all of those places, and the Gotham Health Network, which is sort of the, the chain of, of public outpatient clinics, have really, really robust testing infrastructure. And so if you don't have insurance, um, calling 311 um, and getting connected to an H&H &H provider um, is probably the best way uh, to, to be seen and potentially to get tested for, for COVID-19. The vast, vast majority of the testing that was being done before it got scaled back and moved kind of to hospital-based people only was by appointment. And so you would call and you would speak to someone who would sort of you'd tell their story to over the phone and they would say, um, okay, uh, you have an appointment tomorrow at 1 p.m. at the Elmhurst testing tent, which is located, you know, whatever, 300 feet to the left of the front door or whatever it might be. Uh, and so, so I think if you don't have insurance, if you don't have insurance and you go to city MD or something like that, um, the federal government has, has agreed to pay for, for your COVID-19 testing, but I'm not sure that they'll pay for that visit. Um, and there might be like a, a copay at the beginning or something like that. And, and so uh, one of the things I'm like nervous for and kind of waiting for the foot to drop is like what, um, like all the bills that are going to be coming people's way as a, as a result of this. I don't want anyone to, you know, it's hard not to stress about that um, at the beginning, but I just, I would rather if you don't have insurance, you try and use the public health system, which won't charge you, um, versus trying to use their in, uh, private urgent care center, which will charge you, even if the testing oh. is covered. Okay, question about are newborns at risk due to their low immune system um, that's in development from consuming breast milk? I don't know if it's a separate question of if they should be consuming breast milk, but are they at any increased risk? Um, so it's, yeah, it's like one and a half questions. I'll answer them uh, all. So um, the recommendations right now for breastfeeding are for women who have been breastfeeding to continue breastfeeding, uh, including if they're positive for COVID-19, if they're positive for, you know, I think everyone who's breastfeeding um, right now should be practicing good hand hygiene um, before and after breastfeeding and consider uh, wearing a mask. If you're COVID-19 positive and you're breastfeeding, you should definitely be wearing a mask um, and practicing good hand hygiene before and after. Um, so, 
Um, and then the reality is, is that newborn babies are just as susceptible to this virus as the rest of us are. It's a novel virus, which means not a single person on earth has any immunity to it. That's why everyone's getting infected because no one has ever been exposed to this virus before. So it's, so it's doing what viruses are, are, are really good at. They're really, really good at, at sort of achieving widespread population um, penetrance in a population that's never been exposed to them before. And so newborns, which yeah, have sort of brand new immune systems, um, but in terms of coronavirus, they're just as, as vulnerable as we are. But the data um, has shown there was a, a couple reports of some newborns who were tested as soon as they were born because their mother had uh, COVID-19 and, and some of them came out positive and they, they all did just fine. Um, and so again, they, they for reasons we still don't, we still don't know, um, young people, including really, really young people that get this disease um, have been doing fine. Great, and, and hopefully a, a quick last question. What should you clean your phone with? Oh, so um, you can clean your phone with like a, an alcohol wipe that has at least 70% alcohol. Um, you can clean your phone with like a Clorox wipe or a Lysol wipe, or um, if your phone is waterproof, you could just clean it with soap and water. Um, you can make a 5% a bleach solution, which would, I would, I can't remember the ratios off the top of my head, but if you Google um, like bleach solution COVID-19, it'll tell you like how many tablespoons of, of regular like laundry bleach dilute in water. Um, and all of that to say, and this is actually a great last point, while this virus is very good at, um, at infecting us, it's actually quite easy to kill. Um, soap and water kill it um, really quick, really easily. Just about any household or commercially available cleaner will kill it. Um, so things like Lysol and Clorox and, um, and the different sprays like that um, will all, by the time they're dry on the surface, will have killed the virus. Anything that says like kills 99.9% .9 of something um, will kill this also. Uh, so sometimes if you can like, if you've like, you looped a bunch of hand sanitizer on your hands and you've got extra, you can wipe it on your phone, that, that's fine. Great. Well, um, I think that we're, we're coming right up on three o'clock. So um, if anyone has any additional questions or follow-up questions, uh, you can go ahead and email those to Harmony uh, at harmony.arcilla at nyulancone.org. We will uh, share that email address with you all. We will also share this presentation and recording um, if you want to share it with your coworkers or any other staff that might be um, interested. And I uh, just want to send a huge thank you to Dr. Isaacson for making himself available. I know this is a really busy and uh, chaotic time and you are on the front lines of um, you know, helping some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers. So we really thank you for your time and answering everyone's questions. And, um, and he's also agreed to, to give us some responses to those, any, any additional questions that you have. Um, as he has time. So uh, we will get that out to you when we can. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Isaacson. And yeah, thank you all for joining. Okay. Uh, yeah, so thank you everyone for joining. And uh, anything else that you wanna close with, Dr. Isaacson? Uh, no, keep washing your hands. Um, <laughs> or just to say that like, you know, this is gonna keep, you know, we're sort of in this for a while. So like, it's going to feel annoying and, and, you know, you're like, oh, my God, I've been washing my hands so many times a day for so long. Like, just keep at it. Yeah, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Isaacson. Right. Take care. Bye-bye.